Okay, so we are now talking about vestigial and atavistic structures as pieces of evidence for macroevolution. A vestigial structure or a vestigial character is one in which there is a loss of a structure or it's been reduced or had an altered function from what it was in an ancestral species and in fact it may be still present in sort of a cousin species. Uh, so there's so many evidences of this um, including in we humans which I'll talk about in a second but some of these are, are kind of just out there and you wouldn't even think about them as being um, structures that have an altered or lost function or reduced function from that that it wasn't an ancestor. So the common, um, very common examples with the ostrich. Now everybody knows what an ostrich is. This guy lives in Africa and he's the largest living bird that there is today. And um, this guy has huge wings and in this case it's a lady and she has huge wings that she's using to shade her little babies down there from the sun. But we know that we usually think of wings and a bird as being structures for flying. So based on DNA evidence and other evidence, we know that ostriches are actually descended from flying birds. So their wings are vestigial. They have lost their function. They're no longer used for flying. They now have an altered purpose of being used for shade and probably balance as well. These guys like to run. Um, so that's one just kind of obvious example of a vestigial structure, but some of them are really cool. So check these guys out, cave organisms. So you might remember from our microevolutionary lectures, we said uh, in evolution, if you don't use it, you lose it. In other words, structures that require a lot of energy to produce, like eyesight, they require a lot of ATP. Uh, if it's not being used because of the environment you're in, it's better to put that ATP towards something that you can use, that would be useful. So if you are an organism that lives in the cave and you descended from organisms that did not live in caves, why do you need eyesight now? Your ancestors might have needed it out where there was light, but a cave is dark. So instead, use that energy for something else, like an electric field, as, as many cave fish do. Um, but you'll see whether you're dealing with salamanders or fish, a lot of cave organisms have lost their coloration and they've lost their eyesight. But they still have vestigial remnants of those structures. For example, this cave salamander here. I mean, this particular species, I'm not even going to try to pronounce here, but he actually still has eyes, but they're beneath the skin. So he's completely blind. And you're like, well, if he was specially created, he just wouldn't have eyes. No, this guy still has eyes. They just don't function. They're vestigial because he now lives in the cave. So that's evidence that he descended from a common ancestor that had eyes. So, um, and, and didn't live in caves. And similarly, here's the Mexican tetrafish. And notice he has lost his coloration because you don't need color if you're living in the dark. But check it out. He doesn't have full eyes under, under skin the way this guy does. He actually has pieces of eyes. So he has lens, a little bit of a retina, an optic nerve, and a sclera. These are all parts of working eyes, but they don't work because they're not in the full eye for this guy, he only has the remnants of pieces of eyes. His ancestors had working eyes that lived out in the open where it was light. He has lost his eyesight and lost his complete eye. He just has pieces of it. So those are vestigial structures. How cool is that? So um, as you can see, it need not be that the structures are non-functional. They just have an altered or reduced function compared to that of the ancestor. And again, you can see this all around. Um, so for example, kiwi birds that live in Australia are one of the only birds that can smell. Most other birds have traded the ability to smell for the ability to have really good eyesight. Well, kiwis, it turns out, are active at night, so when it's dark. So they actually don't have very good eyesight. They have kind of reduced eyes, very good noses so that they can stick their beaks into the ground and smell grubs. And uh, he's also evolved to lay huge eggs. But his wings are completely vestigial. He has lost his ability to fly because he likes to forage on the ground. Um, so he just has these little itty bitty wings. Um, those are vestigial wings. They don't serve the function that they did in his flightable, did I just make up that word, ancestral species. Um, same thing with the cassowary. The cassowary is a mean guy. This guy lives in uh, Papua New Guinea. 
And yeah, if you get near him, watch out. He will take his claws and he will gut you. Um, but that is beside the point, although not really because he's taken that energy and he's now put it towards really good claws. He doesn't fly either. And uh, he has these little itty bitty wings. And in fact, the wings are really gone. They're under the skin. And in fact, um, I think my head is blocking this right here. But um, one of the early explorers to that area actually talked about the cassowary and how um, the wings really aren't there. But if you look under the skin, the bones of, you know, the humerus and um, the forearm, just like we have, are still there. Uh, my favorite little guy here, the star-nosed mole. This is his nose. These are his claws. He lives under the ground. There's no light. So his eyes have become vestigial. He's practically blind. Uh, he really doesn't need eyesight, but instead he's put that energy into an awesome nose and awesome claws. Uh, same thing with most moles. Their eyes have become very reduced. They've pretty much lost their eyesight because it's dark under the ground. You really don't need eyesight. You need other things like good smell. So um, then we have some really cool examples of vestigial structures here. I love this guy. This is a flightless weevil. It's a little, little insect, little beetle. There's a species if you're interested. This guy lives on trees, on the bark of trees. And if you know anything about beetles, you know that they actually have two pairs of wings. So they have kind of this membranous wing, set of wings, and then they have this hard outer shell wings on the outside. And for most beetles, like say a ladybug, um, they actually have to open up their outer wings to reveal the membranous wings, which are what really does the flying for it. Well, in the case of this uh, weevil, he's flightless. He lives on the bark of trees and he really doesn't need to go anywhere. He can just crawl along the, the trunk of that tree. And so the outer wings have become fused together and the inner wings are still membranous and separated. So he'd be able to fly if it weren't for the fact that these outer wings are fused together. So he is now a flightless weevil. So therefore those membranous wings underneath are vestigial. They have lost their function because the outer wings keep them from functioning. How cool is that? Uh, we opened this lecture with uh, the slender glass lizard. So there's many different species of slender glass lizards within a family. And some of them look more like a snake and some look less like a snake. So the one I showed at the beginning of the lecture and the ones over here um, all have legs, just like most lizards, right? But there's a species here who has completely lost his legs, yet he's still a lizard. Why do we know he's a lizard and not a snake? Well, he has the mouth structure of lizards and not snakes. Um, so these guys are all related. They're all within the same family. And uh, that's just cool. So you can almost see evolution and progress here as some species have lost, lost their legs and others haven't. So um, in this sense, for these guys who like to pretty much slither on the ground like a snake, the legs have become rather vestigial. And inside the body of this glass lizard, there are still uh, pieces of what would have made a leg, like a pelvis, for example. And modern snakes, you can actually see vestigial structures. So if you are familiar with uh, pythons, which some people have as pets, if you turn them on their belly, you'll see these little claws sticking out, especially in the females. Um, and these are little vestigial elements of what were legs in their reptilian ancestors. Um, in a boa constrictor here, he can see an unattached pelvis under the skin. And um, I'm going to move my head away for just one second so you can actually see in an x-ray, you can see where the legs would have attached here. So, um, so snakes, you know, have um, descended from lizards. They themselves are not lizards. But if you look at the slender glass lizard and you look at some modern snakes, you can really see how over evolutionary time in this area of, of uh, the world, these guys have had selection to get rid of those legs and take to slithering, or maybe you can exploit niches that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Pretty cool. Okay. Um, so... That's with actual structures. Those are kind of morphological vestigial structures, but can behavior be vestigial? Can we have behaviors that we do that are changed in function from what they were in our ancestral species? Why, absolutely we can. So take these guys. These ladies here are whiptail lizards. And there's many species of whiptail lizards. This particular species is parthenogenic. That means that there's only females. 
And so at least most of the time, there's only females. So two females will get together of this particular species and they will do courtship displays and they will whip around each other and act like there's a male and a female, but really there are two females pretending to meet. So um, parthenogenic, um, there are only females and when a female lays an egg, that egg is not fertilized by sperm. It's just from that female. She's basically cloned herself and it will grow into a lizard. It's pretty cool by itself, but that's not the point here. The point here is that these females will still go through courtship displays just as if they were a male and female together. And other species of whiptail lizards do have males and females that go through the same courtship behaviors that these ladies are going through. And they don't have to go through this to have babies, but the ones that choose to actually have the two females get together and do the courtship, they will actually um, be more productive. They will have um, a bigger clutch of eggs, for example. How weird is that? So that courtship behavior that these ladies are exhibiting is vestigial. It came from ancestral species where it was used to get male and female together. They haven't lost the propensity to do that behavior because we know that behavior can have a genetic basis. Wow, how cool is that? Um, reason being, genes can code for hormones, which can cause behavioral processes. Um, you can also have vestigial um, sexual parts. For example, dandelions. All of us know about dandelions. We used to, you know, blow them when we were little, right? Uh, it turns out dandelions are asexual. Uh, how do you get new dandelions? Well, dandelions clone basically send out little clones to make more dandelions. And bees will try to pollinate them. But the pollen from dandelions is actually sterile. It's vestigial. It's from an ancestor that actually had fertile pollen. These guys have kept the pollen, but it doesn't actually produce any baby dandelions now. So it's a vestigial structure. So sex ended, but not forgotten. Um, more vestigial behaviors. Um, so peacocks are related to other uh, kinds of birds like chickens, roosters, and uh, pheasants, ringneck pheasants. And it's very interesting to watch the courtship displays of these birds. So if you watch the courtship display of a rooster to his hen, he actually will peck at the ground, but he'll actually pick up food things like, you know, pieces of corn or things like that. And that attracts the hens over there. And so they'll pick the rooster that to mate with that does that best pecking behavior. Um, but he's basically enticing her with food. Kind of happens in humans too, doesn't it? Um, but if you go down the evolutionary line here, a ringneck pheasant will still peck at the ground and pick up little rocks to impress his female. And peacocks, they've kind of traded picking up food for putting that ATP towards elaborate feathers, the male does, um, but he will still peck at the ground um, to attract his female because he's inherited the propensity to peck as part of the courtship display from a common ancestor with these guys over here. Okay, so uh, again, uh, behaviors can actually be vestigial. So the idea of pecking is vestigial. He's not offering her any food, but she's still attracted to the action of pecking. And what about people? Do we have vestigial structures? You know we do. How many of you have had wisdom teeth and you had to get them removed? Ouch, right? Those are vestigial. They don't serve any purposes for we humans. Other, All they do is just crowd us out. But in an ancestral species, it would have helped to digest um, plants, for example, to, to munch up plants. And so these guys nowadays don't have any, they don't help us with our food and they just get in the way. Or the human appendix. Some people have appendicitis and it bursts and they got to get it removed. That actually, we share a common ancestor with a pig and in pigs and other um, animals that eat a lot of plants, it actually helps to digest um, their plant material. It's part of their intestine. And of course, our tailbone, called the cossex, gives many people um, pain <laughs> when they're sitting down. It, of course, is a vestigial remnant of tails that were in our ancestral primates. So those are vestigial structures. Next up, atavistic structures.